Our first scripture lesson taken for this fourth Sunday in the Trinity season is recorded from the Apostle Paul to the young pastor, Timothy. Apostle Paul encourages the young pastor, we see that Paul himself, as a leader, re- recognizes himself to be a chief of sinners. We can all hold that account as well, because I know for myself, I know my own sins way better than I know anybody else's, and so I too can claim that I am a chief of sinners, just as each one of you can as well today. We recognize how this pattern of Repentance is important as any leader, young or older alike. And so we read from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 17. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Our second lesson is from the Gospel of Luke chapter 15, beginning with verse 11. Glory be to thee, O This may be that familiar section of the prodigal son. There are three individuals in Jesus' parable here, this earthly story with a heavenly meaning, and we remember to examine the character of what each individual is doing. Not just the father, which is the focus of his mercy and love for his faithless son, the one who wandered away and lived however he wanted to, but also the son's repentance the one who is prodigal living, and returning to the Father for mercy. There's also that brother that we often forget about. That brother who looks on the situation and justifies himself as more righteous than his other brother. Where are we in these examples? How are we using these examples of leadership in our life today? We continue by reading from the Gospel of Luke 15, beginning with verse 11. Then he, Jesus, said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and it began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. 
And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his older son was in the fields. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. He said to him, Your brother has come. And because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I have never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fat calf for him. He said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make Mary be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. I think each one of us can rejoice that we are that prodigal son, and at the same time we have been that older brother. What a blessing is that we all have a Heavenly Father who shows us the same compassion, patience, and mercy. Praise be to We have the opportunity this morning to confess what our Heavenly Father has done for us, what our brother Jesus Christ has done for us, and what the Holy Spirit continues to do for us as well. Let's rise and make confession of our faith in the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Be seated.
Dear Pilgrim Partners, every word of God is pure, and all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It's profitable to each one of us for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God be thoroughly equipped, rightly and correctly dividing the word of truth. The question I want to ask you this morning is, how do our behaviors affect the lives of others? Before we answer that question, I'd like uh, my two older sons to come forward at this time. Uh, Titus and Jason, can you come up here for a minute? Just stand right here on both sides of me. So, we know from different accounts of the Bible, like we think of King David, when he was younger, we know he was very young when he fought Goliath and showed that wonderful leadership at such a young age. Today in our text, we're hearing about King Manasseh. If you look before our text at the beginning of that chapter 33 of Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, you see that Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king. Titus isn't quite 12, but he's about 11 and a half, if you ask him. Imagine young Titus becoming your king and what that would be like. And you would hope that if his father... Hezekiah, who is a man of God and a good and righteous king, that you would hope young Manasseh, becoming king, would follow in his father's footsteps. We'll see in a moment what happened with that. Young children are influenced. Our behaviors show in their lives. Our actions affect their actions. Our behaviors affect others. The next generation, of course. If we think about Manasseh and what we'll read about his wickedness and not following the Lord or his father Hezekiah, you might think, well, all young children are impressionable and are only going to follow evil. Well, I brought Jason up here as well because there was another king that we know well, a grandson of Manasseh named Josiah. And he became king of Judah when he was eight years old. How would you like Jason to be your king? It'd be fun. <laughs> the idea here is that in those days, kings were leaders at a very young age. And throughout the Word of God, we actually see leaders for God, young and old alike. Whether it be Josiah, or Manasseh, or the young slave girl, or David, or so many more. Make no mistake, the lesson we're going to learn today is that we are all leaders for Christ. Thank you, boys. And so let's look at our text for today from 2 Chronicles 33. And I'm just going to read the first three verses there for now. Please follow along in your bulletin on page 5. So Manasseh seduced Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. And the Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they would not listen. Therefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the army of the king of Assyria, who took Manasseh with hooks, bound him with bronze fetters, and carried him off to Babylon. This is the word of God for our meditation this morning, so let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, help us to understand through your word. Help us to remember individuals like Manasseh, so that we remember what repentance looks like, and that we remember what rebellion also looks looks like against you. Be with us and send us your spirit, Lord Jesus, in your saving name we pray. Amen. As you see, our theme for today is remember Manasseh, as I just prayed, his rebellion and his repentance. It's kind of funny, when you think of Manasseh, we learn more about him this morning, the word Manasseh means to make one forget. Isn't it interesting, as you listen to the different names of the Bible, it almost fits exactly with what that person did. Manasseh was one of the longest reigning kings in Judah. He reigned for 55 years from, as we learned, age 12 and on. And we know that he did evil in the sight of the Lord. In fact, so much evil that it wasn't even named around the surrounding godless nations. The Lord was very upset and hated what Manasseh was doing. Why? Because Manasseh, as a leader, was leading other people God's people into sin as well. 
In verse 9, it says very clearly that Manasseh seduced Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. Lots of times people ask the question, why did God destroy all those surrounding nations? You worship a very vengeful, angry, hostile God. Well, if we had a number of people break into our house and try to hurt my family, you'd probably see a side of me you wouldn't see before. And protecting my family and protecting my children. Would we not expect our Father in Heaven to do the same thing for His children? To protect them from the evils surrounding them? The Lord teaches us that Manasseh seduced, literally that means to lead the people astray into sinful living. And so we see clearly from just one verse that Manasseh was a very poor leader, a very poor example, whether he was king or not, to the people of Judah. In verse 10, we see that God was angry and was speaking against this behavior. But let's hear a little bit more, because there's not a ton that's said about Manasseh, other than this chapter and then in Kings. Let's hear a little bit more about what he did. So I'm going to read to you the first eight verses before our text. It says, Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. But he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord has had cast out before the children of Israel. For he rebuilt the high places, which his grandfather Ahaz, King Ahaz and Jezebel, remember them? He put up these high places, with Hezekiah, his father, had broken down. He raised up altars for the Baals and made wooden images, and he worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. Before I keep reading, this is kind of the first example of unionism that we see in the Bible. Much like our community churches of today, you have the high places that were built by Ahaz and by rebuilt here by Manasseh. Those places were basically used that if you had a god that you worshipped and they were all different gods, you could go up to these high places and sacrifice to whatever god you wanted. Think community church when you think of those high places. It doesn't really matter what you believe in. Come and worship together. You see unionism back here in the Bible at those, in those days. Manasseh also built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem shall my name be forever. What does God say through Isaiah about his name? My name is holy. I will not give my praise to graven or carved images, things that man has come up with. As we're finishing the dedication, we have a cross that was built over here when we put it up there. If you look at the cover of your bulletin, how would you feel about that man-made image being built in this house of God? Of course, don't worship that image, but that's what Manasseh did. He built an image, he built a false god, Asheriah, which you see in verse 7 here, that the people would worship in God's temple. And he led them into that worship. In Jerusalem shall my name be forever, the Lord said. He built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. Also, if this wasn't enough, he caused his sons to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. He practiced Susain, used witchcraft and sorcery, he consulted mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. If we had that image built here, Bashroth, and I was King Manasseh, I would bring my sons back up and I would sacrifice them to that false god by setting them on fire. The wickedness that Manasseh did was not known in the surrounding countries in the sense that the true god, the Jehovah God, the which they were to worship, Manasseh had totally gone away from him and led the people also the same way. He even set a carved image, the idol which he had made, in the house of God, of which God had said to David and to Solomon his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. And I will not again remove the foot of Israel from the land which I have appointed to your fathers, only if they are careful to do all that I have commanded them, according to the whole law and the statutes and the ordinances by the hand of of Moses. That was verse 8. Those last two verses is really the fulfillment of 10. The Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people. God had sent prophets like Isaiah, like Micah, 
to tell Manasseh, to tell the people to repent. Put away these false gods. Stop putting your earthly wealth and materials. Stop putting everything else ahead of the true God. But verse 10 says very clearly, they would not listen. Therefore, it says in verse 11, the Lord brought upon them the captains of the army of the king of Assyria, who took Manasseh with hooks, bound him with bronze fetters, and carried him off to Babylon. We read from Hebrews chapter 13 that a father who corrects his son or daughter, who disciplines them in a godly way, is one that loves the child. And so you see God, the father, disciplining Manasseh and his people because he wants to bring them back to him and not going after these vain and worthless gods. The Lord does the same thing for us today. He humbled Manasseh. In fact, as we look at this section, it says in verse 11 that they took him out by hooks. Just to get a visual of Manasseh and his pride and glory, worshiping all these false gods, leading people to sin, the kings of Assyria came and took him into captivity. Those hooks idea, it's very interesting. Often the kings were treated with so much contempt and treated so harshly because they had been conquered that they were even more so shamed and humiliated. Manasseh was not only bonded with hooks and led away probably by foot back to Babylon, but they put a hook either through his chin or nose or lips and led him away like an ox to show that he had been conquered. The Lord humbled Manasseh in his own pride and arrogance and showed him who was really in control and who was going to be feared. And so we look back to verses 12 through 13. Manasseh in Babylon in chains and being afflicted. Verse 12 says, When he was in affliction, he implored the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed to him. And he received his entreaty, heard his supplication, and brought him back to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew the Lord was God. What is our lesson here in poor leadership? Yes, Manasseh lived up to his name. He led the people of God to forget the name of God. And I think each one of us can be guilty of that as well. Every time we sin, our behaviors lead someone else into thinking that that sin's okay. As God's people, as Christians who bear his name like God's house, when we sin or when we put something ahead of God, when we misprioritize our life, when we worship money rather than the Lord, or even good health rather than the Lord, What are we showing to the rest of the world? We're living just like Manasseh did. We're being poor leaders by trusting in riches or the cares of the world more than in the Lord. We too need to be humbled. And that's why we come to the Lord's house, isn't it? To hear the weight of our sin. To hear the guilt that we have disobeyed our Father in heaven. To recognize that we are unworthy of our Father's love. Does that sound familiar? prodigal son we talked about a little bit ago unworthy because he'd taken his inheritance and wasted it we are unworthy of the inheritance we have in Christ because we have wasted it so often by not sharing our faith by being poor examples and by not living up to our father's expectations each one of us is guilty we all have to say in our rebellion as we have also forgotten the Lord. And so you see in this first part, this top-down failure from the king to the rest of his people. And we can recognize ourselves how we have also had many moments of that top-down failure, whether father or mother or son or daughter. We are not worthy of the Lord's love. In fact, we're reminded that whoever loves father or mother, son or daughter more than me, Jesus says, not worthy of me. What a blessing it is that we see in the second half of this text. That's not the end of the story for Manasseh. That's not the end of the story for us as we lump ourselves in with Manasseh and all those other wicked kings, leaders, who are leading people astray with the sinful things that they did. We find the other side as well. The repentance, the restoration, and the love shown to him. Look in verse 14 through 16 of our text. After this, Manasseh built a wall outside the city of David on the west side of Gihon 
in the valley as far as the entrance of the fish gate, and it enclosed Offal. And he raised it to a very great height. Then he put military captains in all the fortified cities of Judah. He took away the foreign gods and the idol from the house of the Lord and all the altars that he had built in the mount of the house of the Lord and in Jerusalem. And he cast them out of the city. He also repaired the altar of the Lord, sacrificed peace offerings and thank offerings on it, and commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. How did Manasseh get to that point? Repentance is literally a 180. It's a turning away from sin. God says, this is sin. Remember, it's not what I say is sin. It's what God says is sin. And repentance is not only saying, yeah, I'm sorry for doing that, but I'm going to turn away from that. I'm going to seek God's help and not do that again. We see the top-down forgiveness. From the Lord to Manasseh. From Manasseh to the people and to his children. What a blessing that we can see that same top-down forgiveness to us from the authority, from God the Father himself, through our Savior, his Son, Jesus Christ. We see repentance, which is appropriate for us to think about today before we all stand up here before the Lord's altar to take the Lord's Supper. The Lord says when we come here, we want to come with confession and absolution, repentance of what we have done wrong. We have no business being up here if we think that we're righteous, if we think we're holy in God's eyes. It was not meant for the righteous, but for sinners. As we saw in our lesson from 1 Timothy. And so we can rejoice that repentance has these two parts. Of not just we see with Manasseh being right with God, in God's righteousness and forgiveness of him, but being right with others too, by asking for forgiveness from them as well. That's why the Lord says, in our humility here, we recognize that we have sinned against others. That we've not just sinned against God, but we've been an offense to other people as well. And so we plead for God's mercy and come to his table in his house to be shown, to be poured out like the rains watering our earth today. To continue to be poured out on us, that blood of our Savior, that washes away, that puts away that sin from our mind. So that we can be like Manasseh and yes, to lead one to forget that what Christ has done for us to lead us to forget the guilt of our sins, to wipe us away clean, to give us a clean slate and say, no, I love you despite what you have done. Just like an earthly father and mother can do, our Heavenly Father has done perfectly for each one of you. Wash clean through the blood of Christ. And now the Lord in this sacrament says, take and eat, this is my body, this is my blood, so that I will have union with you, with your soul, in this gospel message. The Lord has called each one of us to be leaders. And he reminds us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, but you are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. You're kingly. A holy nation. His own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Who once were not a people but are now the people of God. Who have not obtained mercy but now have, who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. And as Peter goes on to say, as we mentioned yesterday at the victory service, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. You and I are leaders. You cannot argue that. You cannot question that. As a Christian, you walk for Christ. As you rejoice in his mercy for all of our rebellion, as we rejoice that he has caused our faith to be repentant, to have sorrow for our sin, and to turn away from God through the Spirit. What a blessing it is that as leaders, you and I, through the help of the Holy Spirit, can be a good example, a positive example, so that not only our friends and family, our neighbors, but the next generation, the one to come, would continue to serve and love the one true God. The blessing of this is that that's not up to us to make the next generation to believe. In fact, as Manasseh repented, his next son in line for the throne, Amnon. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. His reign lasted two years. He was put to death by the people. 
But his grandson, eight years old, Josiah, learned some lessons from a young age, didn't he? And he led the people with righteousness. What a blessing it is. Young or old alike, the Lord will use us as his leaders. May he enable us through his spirit that we will be God-pleasing leaders for our families, for our friends, and for Christ. Out of our love and joy for what Christ has done for us. Remember Manasseh, his rebellion, and his repentance. Amen. Please rise. May this peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and your minds in our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It's always my goal to keep you up to date with what's going on in the Synod as much as possible. And today, if you remember him, I don't know how you could forget him, but uh, seminary graduate Sam Rodabaugh is being installed and ordained as pastor in Winter Haven, Florida. He and his wife, Jess, are also expecting twin boys, if you hadn't heard that also. So we'll pray for them for all those things. <laughs> Dear Lord Jesus, 
as we rejoice in how you continue to lead us through your holy word. We ask that you continue to lead Sam and Jess in the congregation of Winter Haven. Bless them today as they begin their ministry there. Continue to help and guide and direct them. Keep them safe. Keep them confident in your holy word as you help them always to seek you first above all things. Help the congregation as well to support them and to also show them the same love that you have shown to them and to each one of us. Bless all of us with that forgiveness and compassion that we desperately need in the view of our failures and the view of your forgiveness. Help us today as we reflect on your word, the lessons that you teach us about leadership. Help us to remember Manasseh so that in our own rebellion, we see your mercy. That in our own repentance, we see your mighty forgiveness. Help us to rejoice in this always, especially as we come to your table today, to be filled again with your spirit of comfort. Through this word and sacrament today, which we receive through our body, we receive your precious body and blood through the bread and wine in a miraculous way. Help us to come with repentant hearts so that we know that we do not deserve your great love, but yet you have destined to dwell with us through your gospel promise. Continue to help us to always rejoice in this great love and mercy as we lead by our example and behaviors so that we can lead others to your cross. Bless us always, Lord Jesus, and help us always to seek you first above all things. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Please rise as we continue with the communion liturgy on the bottom of page 6. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, knowing that God searches our hearts, I ask you, are you sorry that you have sinned against him in thought and word and deed? And do you hope by the Holy Spirit to mend your sinful life? And declare so by saying, yes, with the help of God. Upon this confession of your sins, I announce the grace and peace of God to you. And in the stead and by the command and authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lift up your hearts in the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is meet and right so to do. It is right and spiritually beneficial that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with your only begotten Son and the Holy Spirit our one God and one Lord. And in the confession of the only true God, we worship the Trinity in person and the unity in substance, of majesty co-equal. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we magnify your glorious name, praising you and singing. Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night which he betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Just whenever you eat it in remembrance of me. In the same way, also after supper, he took the cup and gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant, the new promise in my blood which was shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Just whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. May this peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you always. you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you, be gracious unto you. Lord, lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.
to see you all today. I was certainly glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord to be able to hear his comfort and receive his forgiveness once again, his love for us. If you look on page 10, there's a couple announcements that I want to share with you there, just to call your direction to. Uh, this coming Wednesday, we have an important day. We have our TVBS uh, flyer outreach. That's how we invite the neighborhood to our VBS at the end of the month. And so we need as many people as we can, uh, starting at 9 o'clock here, to distribute those uh, 3,500 door flanger door hangers that we're doing. So if you'd like to uh, walk about, rain or shine, it's a lot more fun in the rain, um, to come and deliver some of those flyers. You're delivering the word of God too and you're inviting people to come. So if you can make it, that would be awesome. We usually have like a, a pizza lunch, <coughs> a pizza lunch after we're done and games if possible. Also, uh, I want to, before I forget, I want to thank the Goldovsky family for the flowers from the service yesterday for Billy Jean's victory service and the Shabrell family for the altar flowers up there as well. Uh, appreciate that. As we get closer to finishing the projects, we're going to be trying to do more work in uh, organizing 
um, and getting help in all these different areas, whether it be uh, altar committees, all these different things we want to reorganize as we get done with the, the project, which is close. I don't remember if we told you, July 21st is the end of the contract date, so the contractors are supposed to be done in three weeks. Um, after that, there'll be a lot of work to do. In fact, there's work to do now because they're going to be using the fellowship hall. For anyone who can stay and even carry a chair or two over to the steps, we've got to get all the tables and chairs back downstairs. The floor needs to be washed again after lunch yesterday, and then the workers need to be cutting more in there. Trim work up front is not quite done. Other things need to be cut, so we've got to get everything out of there again. So anyone who can, even if you just carry a chair over to the steps, that'll be helpful. Um, also, if you look ahead, we have our church picnic. I'll be sending more uh, things out about that, announcements. Uh, that's July 23rd after church, and then it'll be at Buttermilk Park. So please keep that in mind. Um, I feel like there's a couple of announcements. I'm forgetting, yes. What? Yes, not just the chairs and tables. Uh, the choir room also, because they're doing the ceiling and floor in there this week. There's a couple of things in there, pianos and stuff, that need to be moved out. Again, if everyone helps, it'll probably take like 10 minutes. But uh, please do stick around if you can. Is there another announcement? Yes? Or snacks. announcement that I'm forgetting. Lord, continue to bless you. Please uh, guess, sign our guest book in the entryway, and let us look forward to joining together as the Lord continues to bless us with his word. Lord be with you all.